Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second webinar of the year. My name is Pauline Matindan Garcia. I am the Director of Care Transition for Livingston Memorial VNA and Hospice. I will be moderating today's webinar. Before I introduce our speaker, I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping notes. Today's presentation will be recorded and will be available for viewing um, through our website. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat function to submit your questions. We will answer all the questions that you have at the end of the presentation. If you run into any troubleshooting issues or IT issues, please use the chat function as well um, to send in your issues and we will do our best to provide some IT support. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to go over just a couple of background about Dr. Dial. So Dr. Lanyard K. Dial is a leader in family medicine and geriatric medical education. He served as director of family practice residency at the Ventura County Medical Center from 1987 till 2002. Since 1998, Dr. Dial has been a national leader in geriatric continuing medical education with the American Academy of Family Physicians. He was the chairman of the geriatric review course who de and developed and thought, uh, taught geriatric section of the AAFP's family practice board exam review course. Dr. Dial has served on the physician advisory board of the Ventura County Alzheimer's Association. In 1986, he became the medical director of Livingston Visiting Nurse Association. In July 2007, Dr. Dial became Livingston CEO, president, and medical director. In June 2021, Dr. Dial retired from the CEO and president position, but continues his passion as living since medical director. As a longtime Ventura County resident, Dr. Dial works to improve the quality of medical services for the elderly, homebound, and terminally ill. Dr. Dial received his medical degree from Washington University School of Medicine in 1981. He's a member of the American Board of Family Practice and holds certificates of added qualification in, in both geriatric medicine and hospice and palliative medicine. He, his faculty appointment is at UCLA Associate Professor of Family Medicine. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Dial. Well, good morning or afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to spend some time with you to give you new information about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and we have a lot to cover. Uh, but I think I, you will find this fascinating uh, and it's significant in its uh, newness to us. Uh, most of this information will be uh, available in the last six to nine months and I thought it important to bring it to you today. Um, so I'm going to share my slides so that together we can look at this, this information. So uh, there's my name uh, and um, my title here at Livingston. Uh, and as Pauline said, I still hold a associate professorship at uh, the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Um, we're going to talk today about a review of Alzheimer's disease. About nine months ago in July last year, I gave an update on uh, this format uh, about dementia, uh, about its differential diagnoses, uh, about how clinically those present. Uh, and today we're gonna focus on Alzheimer's. I am going to though review for you uh, what Alzheimer's disease is and be very specific about it. Uh, I'm not going to cover the other dementias. That webinar, like this one, was videoed uh, and is available for you to review should you want to take a look at the differential diagnosis of dementias. We're going to cover uh, advances in the diagnosis. We're going to cover FDA-approved treatment advances. These are major advances in our medical world. Um, these are incredibly complicated medicine behind these. I could and thought about um, stopping here, telling you 
that there are new brain scans, new blood tests, and new disease-modifying drug infusions available for patients who have Alzheimer's disease. Knowing, therefore, that you would seek medical care for yourself or loved ones or advise uh, others who have Alzheimer's disease or who are concerned about Alzheimer's disease, that there are new scans, new blood tests, new infusions, uh, because that's the fact. And many physicians, because this is so new, um, are not familiar with this. So empowering you to seek medical care uh, related to these is the important part of this presentation. But I felt that giving you more information would be appropriate under both of these um, two areas. Uh, although again, it's incredibly complex. So I will do my best to make it understandable to you. Um, but the bottom line is you should be aware that there are new scans, new blood tests, and new infusion therapy to treat Alzheimer's disease. So our quick review of dementia, it, again, it's a syndrome. It's a group of symptoms. Those symptoms of memory loss, visual spatial loss, um, language inabilities. It's characterized by um, inability of the person to process new memories early on, but it spreads throughout the brain and you have other intellectual functions that are affected. It's also associated with change in mood, uh, change in behavior, and rarely are any of the dementias reversible, and almost all of them uh, have an underlying cause that continues to damage the brain, and certainly that's the case with Alzheimer's disease. This is the umbrella I shared with you before. All dementias, 100% um, under the umbrella with those symptoms. Alzheimer's disease itself causes about 50 to 70% of those. Uh, vascular insults to the brain, uh, we've discussed before, can give this same picture. Parkinson's associated Lewy body disease can look like uh, Alzheimer's disease, but is separate and frontal temporal dementias. According to the Alzheimer's Association, we currently have approximately 6 million people in the United States with Alzheimer's disease. In the age group between 65 to 74, there are 31 million seniors and about 3% of them have Alzheimer's disease. Between the ages of 75 and 84, 17% of the 16 million there that's another 2 million people with Alzheimer's, and then 32% of those over the age of 85. And there are 6.6 .6 million people like that, so that's approximately another two, little over 2 million people. So the total combined number is close to 6 to 7 million right now. Here is that on a slide for you to see. Um, we are at just past 2020 where this graph shows you 5.8, and you can see by 2030, we're gonna be at 8.4 million people. The purple on the top are people aged over 85, and you can see that they are gonna be growing uh, numbers of them with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then in addition, uh, the patients between the ages of 75 and 84. Obviously, people between 65 and 74 can get this disease, uh, you can see the numbers there. It's approximately a million people in the United States today. Um, but those have significant impacts because those individuals at 65 are now going to live with this disease uh, through much of their early elder life and take away a lot of their abilities during that time. Alzheimer's classically is what Ronald Reagan had, the memory impairment, the language impairment, the visual spatial impairment lack of motor or sensory changes going along with that. That's the clinical picture of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we've talked about that a lot, a lot the last time, but you need to understand in order to understand the testing I'm going to talk about that you need to have a patient who has clearly has Alzheimer's uh, and those are the clinical presentation findings. Historically, our definitive diagnosis has been based on this classic clinical picture, 
and biopsies of the brain. Those biopsies um, are not done very often pre-morbid, uh, but brain histology after someone has died that can confirm the definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's has been uh, common in our medical world. So having a definitive diagnosis has always relied upon a classic clinical picture and some kind of brain histology. The vast majority of people that we take care of don't have brain histology done. So we believe they have Alzheimer's based on their classic picture, but we don't have the histology. So we call those probable Alzheimer's disease as our diagnosis. Possible diagnosis are those that don't have quite the classic clinical picture. We don't have histology to tell us, uh, and there's no other alternative in our other differentials, so we think they likely have Alzheimer's disease. This is the brain. Um, we know a lot about it. There's a lot we don't know. Um, these are the areas of the brain that we give it names to. This temporal lobe area, if you can see uh, my cursor there, is the area where Alzheimer's begins. Um, and on this next slide, you can see where the memory processing center is in that temporal lobe. You can see the visual cortex, the area of the brain responsible for vision is the yellow on the far right side, uh, area responsible for movement or sensation, taste, touch, hearing, all in the top portions of the brain, uh, decision-making, planning, affect, um, your, your personality is in the blue frontal part of the brain, uh, but Alzheimer's begins in that green memory processing area. We know about the brain that there's electrical activity. Uh, that electrical activity drives a lot of what happens in the brain, uh, and we can measure that electrical activity. The functional unit of the brain is the neuron. It's the individual cell that makes up all the brain matter, and it is what is the most important part of understanding any disease of the brain, its effect on the individual cell of the brain, the neuron of the brain. That neuron connects to another neuron via a process that comes out from the bottom of it, as you can see there, called the axon, and it connects two processes that stem from that neuron body called dendrites. So the axon communicates from one cell to another by attaching to another cell's dendrites. And it doesn't attach, actually. The connection is called a synapse. Uh, the two come close together, the axon and the dendrite, and then the axon releases chemicals that are then picked up by the dendrite and all information in the brain is communicated between that axon and that dendrite of another neuron via the chemicals that are produced. So incredibly complicated system. Uh, what's important to understand is the functional element of the brain is the neuron and that there are chemicals in that neuron that are released to communicate and send information back and forth across the brain. Alzheimer's disease starts as a plaque, a plaque up here in the red that grows and destroys axons and dendrites. The plaque is made up of a protein called amyloid. We're not understanding yet why the amyloid decides to do this, but the key factor from this point forward in our discussion is that amyloid protein destroys axons and dendrites of the neurons. And it's that amyloid protein destruction that creates the situation of bad memory loss and progressive illness of Alzheimer's disease. So here's the neuron, here's its axon, here are its dendrites. The amyloid plaque develops and destroys the axon and the dendrites. The framework, kind of the scaffolding of the axon and dendrites is made up of another protein. And that other protein is important in this discussion. It's called tau, T-A-U. 
And the tau framework and structure of the axon and dendrites is destroyed when the amyloid plaque it develops and destroys the axon and dendrites. So releasing tau outside of the axon and dendrites. Um, so tau protein is broken down because of the amyloid plaques. This is the histology you look for. You see the plaques of amyloid there in the middle and up in the upper left. Uh, you see a lot of yeah. destruction of neurons. Uh, that is Alzheimer's disease. So this is a gentleman with his brain open to us that you can see, and we start in Alzheimer's forming these plaques and tangles in the area of uh, where it says their hippocampus, but it's the temporal lobe, and then those spread from early Alzheimer's disease to later in the disease to later in the disease, uh, the spread of those plaques and tangles throughout the brain. So in summary, to remind us again about Alzheimer's, you have beta amyloid plaques that are destroying neurons. You have the release of tau proteins from axons and dendrites. And because of the destruction of the axons and dendrites, the chemical communication is now changed uh, because the synapse where you release those chemicals has been destroyed because you've destroyed the axons and dendrites. So now with that as a background, I can explain to you the advances that we've seen in the last nine months. First advance I'm going to talk about are the imaging studies, the brain scans that have been developed that you should understand. Uh, and the first one of those is MRI advances I'll talk about. I'll talk about functional PET scans and we'll get into some of the details of that language. I'll talk about amyloid and tau protein PET scans uh, because those have been developed and are crucial now in our, in our making this diagnosis. Then we're going to talk about the use of biochemical markers, uh, blood tests that are available. Uh, in, these have also available and have been available in, in, in the testing of your fluid that comes around your, your brain, a cerebral spinal fluid that we can get from doing, get, get out of you by doing a spinal tap um, or blood tests. So those are the advances we're going to discuss, and I'll put them in context as we go along here. First, MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. MRIs have been available to us for many years now. Um, Back when I was in medical school in the late 1970s, uh, we, medicine across the country, developed the ability to do magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, some of you've had MRIs. I suspect many of you've had MRIs uh, or you've heard of MRIs. Uh, you're inside a donut. Uh, the magnet is turned on. It whisks around you. Uh, it creates changes in the electron configuration of your body. Uh, which allows it to be visualized. Uh, and you can do MRI imaging of the brain. And we have done that for years to try to determine if you have a tumor, or, but you can't do MRI imaging and see amyloid. You can't do MRI imaging and see neurons being destroyed. Um, MRI imaging is not sensitive enough to do that. So the use of MRI imaging continues to advance. And in the last several years, they've developed artificial intelligence assisted MRIs, uh, which allows a more complex analysis of the MRI. They've developed ultra high field MRIs. They've done echo gradients of MRIs. What I wanna leave you with is there's high likelihood that an MRI can be used down in the future to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. Today, no. Uh, but the last year has seen these three options become more and more tested, and the research looks very promising that we'll be able to use an MRI scan to diagnose Alzheimer's, uh, but not yet. However, 
PET scanning um, is now available to diagnose Alzheimer's. Uh, PET scanning is positron emission tomography. The difference here is that a radioactive labeled chemical is put in your, inside your blood vessels. That chemical circulates around and we can do a PET scan that will find where that chemical goes and what happens to it. This isn't new. We've had PET scans for some time. Uh, PET scanning has been done uh, looking at the brain and the way um, it, it functions. PET scanning has been done for people looking for cancers. Um, all of it's the same basic test. We infuse into you a radio labeled chemical. That chemical goes throughout your body. We image the area where we're interested in looking to see what happens with that chemical. So PET scanning in the field of looking at Alzheimer's. The first PET scan that was developed to look at Alzheimer's used a radioactive labeled glucose. And the radio label is a fluorine label, that's the FD glucose. And that glucose is metabolized by the neurons of the brain. So when the neurons have been damaged, they don't metabolize that. So what you see are areas of the brain that are lacking the ability to take up this glucose. And historically, this test has been available and was the gold standard test in all research in the United States to look at, does this person most likely have Alzheimer's disease clinically and using the functional fluorinated glucose PET scan to say, yes, it looks like their neurons are not taking up glucose well. One of the recent advances is in October 2023, Medicare made the decision to say, we are now agreeing that this test has become more standard and we will cover the utilization of this test as part of Medicare coverage, which means all Medicare patients in the United States can now get this test, whereas historically it was only available in research protocols. Um, so huge advance because we've been doing this test and now Medicare says it'll be covered. If you're part of any Medicare Advantage program in the United States, they will cover it because this is, this is a Medicare covered test. But they've also worked and developed an amyloid PET scan, uh, much more sensitive and Medicare, because of the development of this, agreed it will pay for an amyloid PET scan. This will become the standard of medical care to diagnose Alzheimer's disease because it is much more specific than the D-glucose testing. There are three different current fluorinated chemicals that are bind to amyloid. You are radio, they're radioactively labeled. We insert them into your body via a blood infusion, uh, wait an hour and scan your brain, looking to see does amyloid in, in excess be deposited in your brain making the diagnosis that you likely have Alzheimer's disease much more likely. Uh, we're working on tau PET scans. Um, those, those are currently under investigation. The report is there's a better correlation, uh, but I can tell you as of today, amyloid PET scans are available in Ventura County at all the major radiologic institutes. They are paid for by Medicare and they confirm a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Here is the images that you get on the left is a patient with mild Alzheimer's disease, and on the right you see the control patients. You can see how the fluorinated chemical uh, imaged by PET scan highlights and lights up amyloid in the brain. So this is a definitive diagnosis using this amyloid testing PET scan. So on the left, um, you see a healthy individual who has had at the bottom a structural MRI that has implied to us maybe they have Alzheimer's. And that has been what we've been using the most clinically. However, 
fluorinated now PET scans and amyloid PET scans, fluorinated glucose and now amyloid PET scans will take over that and have moved out of the research world into the clinical world. And the three then on the right are three other things that are being developed, tau PET scans that I mentioned, uh, and two others, um, all in process and looking at. But we now have the ability to, without a biopsy, confirm a diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's disease. How about chemical markers? So the MRIs or the PET scans uh, and this, this shows the fluorinated glucose PET scan. Um, historically, as we've done, I said those in research protocols and historically using up in the upper right hand corner, obtaining cerebral spinal fluid from the back of a patient by putting a needle into the spinal column to measure amyloid levels, tau levels. That has been the history of this illness and the development of, of CSF blood, CSF chemical analysis and D-glucose uh, PET scans has made our, us able to do research on the treatment of this disease. But it's unrealistic to have made that available to all patients because uh, having a CSF test, having a D-glucose scan, was complicated, wasn't paid for, but in research centers, that's what was done. Now, and, and let me show you the results of those. So you can see on the left graph, uh, this is beta amyloid in a control patient. This is a beta amyloid levels in a mixed disease and an Alzheimer's disease. So beta amyloid is less in the CSF when somebody has Alzheimer's disease, because it's being used and deposited in the brains in clumps. So there's less of it floating around in the brain. Whereas tau proteins, which is the right side, because you're destroying axons and dendrites, you release the tau proteins. So patients with Alzheimer's disease have more of those in their CSF fluid. Now we move to blood-based biomarkers. And as we've mentioned, uh, the two main biomarkers you're going to look at is beta amyloid. And measuring simple beta amyloid in the blood can be enhanced by doing a ratio of two types of beta amyloid, type 42 and type 40. And it's the ratio of beta amyloid 42 to 40 that gives you the indication that this individual has Alzheimer's disease. So you can do a blood test, you measure the amount of, alpha, uh, of amyloid beta 42, you measure the amount of amyloid beta 40 in the blood, and a ratio of those that's less than 0.15 indicates that there are plaques forming in the brain using up amyloid beta 42. These blood tests correlate very well with an amyloid PET scan. You can do blood tests looking at tau blood levels, which go up when the person has brain damage. So plasma tau blood levels correlates with the amyloid PET scans and the tau PET scans. So measurement of both amyloid beta ratios and tau blood levels can confirm a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. There are other biochemical markers that have been looked at. One called uh, the most, the third one that's most commonly talked about is neurofilament light or abbreviated NFL with a small f. Uh, components of axons um, is that neurofilament light. So when the axons are destroyed, you get higher blood levels of this. However, it's not as specific as tau uh, because you do see those structural changes and damage in multiple sclerosis and ALS and Parkinson's. Uh, so it's not as a specific a test, but it is one that people have looked at and worked with. Uh, there's a glial, which is one of the other cell types in the brain, um, protein level that's also available. I just include these because as I'll show you, 
Uh, one of them, the neurofibrillary light, has gained a little prominence, so I wanted you to know about it. So back to the concept of the blood markers. You go in, you have blood tests done that'll look for ratios of beta amyloid and look for tau. Those tests are accurate. Those tests are valid tests. Having a clinical diagnosis is essential to interpret those tests. The predictive value of the tests is unclear, and I'll explain what I mean there. And these tests are best used to confirm the clinical diagnosis. And if gotten in conjunction with an amyloid PET scan, is highly specific that that person has Alzheimer's disease. I listened um, across the country to various presentations about this and pulled from a presentation at the University of Wisconsin's Alzheimer's Research Center this idea because I thought it, it made this a little clear. So Minnie Mouse has dementia, clinically has dementia. It looks like Alzheimer's. You can do blood tests amyloid scans, and you can say for Minnie Mouse, absolutely, yes, she has Alzheimer's disease. Mickey Mouse. Mickey has very few, if any, symptoms, but his parents have dementia, or at least one of his parents, or one of his relatives, and he wants to know, will I get Alzheimer's disease? Right now, no, we can't, we don't know what an amyloid PET scan and what blood tests will do to predict whether Mickey Mouse is going to get Alzheimer's disease. We can tell you that many who has the illness right now clinically has Alzheimer's and doesn't have one of the other damaging illnesses. Mickey, we can't help you with. Donald. A healthy person wants to know, will I ever get this disease? Can you do any of these tests on me and tell me, will I develop dementia in the future? No, we can't do that. So who these tests are important for is many. We've had nine months of utilizing these tests. What's going to happen in the next five years Maybe that we can help Mickey and, and Donald, but for right now, the person we can help best is a mini mouse. LabCorp is a national company, for-profit company that has developed first amyloid tau profiles and will be the company that most, most uh, blood tests are sent to, um, their profile is three things. It's a simple objective blood test to identify Alzheimer's pathology so that you, directed at doctors, can give your patients and family clearer actions. The tests they do are three things. They will do an amyloid beta ratio of 42 to 40, they will do out of the blood a phosphorylated tau, which is the most specific for breakdown protein tau in the brain. And they will do the neurofilament, uh, neurofilament light chain test. All three of those, the ATN test, will be done with a single blood draw, and they will come back with results to the physician saying, here are the results, they're highly predictive, this person has Alzheimer's disease. And the charge for this test being done by doctor orders is $626. Right now, to my knowledge, Medicare is not paying for these blood tests. The insurance plans are yet to pick up payment for these blood tests. So these blood tests would be paid out of pocket, ordered by the doctor to determine if your loved one or yourself have this, have Alzheimer's disease. Again, if you're Minnie Mouse, if, if, if you're Minnie Mouse, these will be useful. These are not going to be useful in someone who wants to predict their future. Here's the most interesting part of this talk. Quest Labs, which is a national company, uh, multiple lab testing sites, 
many in Ventura County, says, oh, well, you know what? We will do amyloid ratio testing. We will not do tau testing. We will not do neurofilamentary light, neurofilament light testing. We will do the ratio testing for $399. And by the way, all you got to do is go to their website. You don't need a doctor to order it. So Quest has opened this up to the market and how it works, you go online, you pay and buy the lab test and schedule an appointment to go see their lab and have your blood drawn. Number two, you visit the Quest lab and then have your blood drawn. Number three, your results come back and they give you the option to discuss your results with a physician as part of your 300 dollar payment. So Quest Lab has decided to open this up to the open market. Um, obviously, there's a lot of issues here uh, because there's going to be a lot of Mickeys and a lot of Donalds getting themselves tested uh, with very unclear what it means. Um, but for the Minnie Mouse world, it is a less expensive way to get a test. It is only testing beta amyloid ratios. It is not testing uh, beyond that. We have historically classified Alzheimer's disease in the mild, moderate, and severe classifications. That's on this graph or on this diagram, stage four, five, and six. The future has been recommended that we add stages one, two, and three. One, two, and three, one and two is, well, you don't even have any symptoms, but we now have blood evidence or scanning evidence that you have the high likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease. That's kind of the Mickey Mouse stage. Stage three is many. You have symptoms, but they're very mild, and we can do the testing and say you have the disease. Now, the push in the world of medicine in the United States right now is to develop a better understanding of stages one and two. The analogy I can give you is that many of you have gone to your physician, had blood tests for do I have diabetes and you have no symptoms? But we can test your blood, determine that you are pre-diabetic with a high likelihood you're going to develop diabetes and then begin some planned treatments, weight loss, diet control, et cetera, to delay your developing diabetes and maybe make it so you don't get there. Is that going to be an option for us to use blood testing and amyloid scans to say you have no symptoms, but we look at this and say you are preclinical in this disease process? Right now, the stage three is where we're recommending people get testing done, uh, but the powers in the in of medicine in the united states have said we should really consider that as the third stage because there will be likely a pre-symptom stage that we can determine that's the diagnosis advances we've seen we now have pet amyloid scans we have pet tau scans soon available we have the d glucose scans still available, now covered by Medicare, the amyloid PET scan, now covered by Medicare, and we have the blood tests. The FDA, I think, almost certainly will approve those blood tests and they'll be paid for sometime this year. Um, but Quest has already said, we're gonna reach out and start testing people. Why is all this going on? Why and what a benefit is all this testing? And the benefit is that we now have available disease-modifying treatment. Treatment 
to alter the future course of this disease by treating the underlying amyloid destruction of neurons. Um, this disease-modifying treatment isn't great yet. It isn't um, simple, um, it, it, but it's the beginning. And the excitement in the world of Alzheimer's is now we can actually make a definitive diagnosis, and now we have the first available treatment to specifically go after amyloid to try to alter the, the future of this illness. Historically, all we've had is symptom treatment. We have not been able to get rid of amyloid. We have symptom treatment used acetylcholine because that's the chemical neurotransmitter in the synapse that is missing as you destroy those dendrites and axons. And that acetylcholine, by giving patients that back, you can hold off some of the symptoms, some of the memory loss. And you know these chemicals, they're Aricept, they're Namenda, uh, they're Galantamine. They are chemicals that help people. They don't stop the disease. They don't treat the amyloid. They're re providing chemicals back to the brain to try to see if it can't function better. And that's all we've had available to us are, are these symptom treatment chemicals. But in this last several years, they've been working on monoclonal antibodies against amyloid and giving you an infusion of these monoclonal antibodies. Now, monoclonal antibodies are a really complex medical um, discussion. You might have heard of them when you have heard about some of the COVID treatments because people with early but progressive COVID disease were getting monoclonal antibodies against the COVID virus um, so that they could fight it better. These, an these antibodies are, have been developed against amyloid and can be infused into your blood. They get into the brain and they destroy the amyloid. So that's the disease modifying treatment we have available. How they destroy the amyloid is very complicated. We don't know it absolutely for sure. It goes after that amyloid as it starts to combine and form its plaque. It stops the breakdown uh, of, of the amyloid protein itself to inhibit it from damaging your brain. So the anti-amyloid monoclonal antibody, which is abbreviated as a MAB, has been available for several years. Uh, the first one, aducanumab, Biogen manufactured it. Uh, it was at a cost of $56,000 worth of treatment in a year. Medicare said, we'll pay for it only for people in research trials uh, because its effect was not that good. Then along came Lacanumab. Again, another Biogen, but with another company, Issei, at a cost of it's a lot less. And the FDA in late 2023 gave approval to infuse this drug in early Alzheimer's patients. Medicare said, therefore, we will cover it. So we have the first Medicare covered infusion of an anti-amyloid antibody into you. Um, physicians who are doing this have to register with Medicare because Medicare wants the data. They want the information. Lilly has its, 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 monamine, uh, its monoclonal antibody ready for approval. Um, you may have seen in the news this last week, it's still on hold. Uh, so we still only have one FDA approved Medicare covered uh, chemical, uh, that's lecanemab. So what does it do? It's infused in the brain. And what you see here is over 18 months, it gets rid of amyloid in the brain. The green line is 
would know is is the lecanemab group and the black line at the top is no lecanemab and the testing here is a amyloid PET scan. So you get rid of amyloid in the brain and the PET scan, the amyloid PET scan shows that that amyloid is going away when this is infused into you. And that same test, that same research protocol showed that people who had that done over that 18 months had less symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. The black, what's bad is both lines go down. People's memory does not get better, but it gets less worse with the, with the lecanemab. So not a panacea, but certainly something that helps us treat this illness. It certainly blocks the amyloid and there is certainly improvement in people uh, over that 18 months. They don't have as bad decline in their ability and their function as they do if, they, if they're just getting controls. So where does lecanemab fit into this? Currently, it's recommended in people with stage three disease. Early, mild cognitive symptoms, abnormal blood tests, abnormal amyloid scans, clearly have Alzheimer's disease at an early stage, we can help those people. We can, over time infusing this drug, have their disease get less severe. We're not at a point where we can use it in the preclinical stage, and as people get worse with this illness, it's not gonna be effective. So that's where it fits in to this armamentarium. Acanemab, that's the name of it. Um, that's where you get it. Um, and it's a very effective medicine at this point. It's approved for people with early Alzheimer's. Back to my three characters, this is the treatment many mouse is getting. Today in Ventura County, you can get blood tests, you can get amyloid PET scans, and you can get lecanemab infusions. Any doctor can do them. Most primary care doctors are not gonna be doing this. This is gonna be infused mostly by the neurologists in our community. Um, and uh, most of the neurologists in our community have the ability now to infuse this medicine. There are side effects from this drug. Two kinds, uh, one mild called amyloid related imaging abnormalities. So when you look at the brain in people who are getting the infusion of this, there can be some swelling, an, an edema called aria E, amyloid related imaging abnormality of edema or some small bleeding areas, area H. Those occur in about 10% of patients. 3% of people get symptoms related to those amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. Those symptoms, headaches, confusion, visual changes. So you're getting an infusion of a chemical that's going to reduce the ability of that amyloid to destroy your brain, yet it could, you could develop some symptoms. Serious symptoms, major, more major bleeding happens in less than 1% of people, and in people who have a genetic makeup called ApoE4, and they have two ApoE4 alleles, those are at the highest risk for the intracerebral hemorrhages. So the protocol for this infusion is as described here. You get a baseline MRI scan, you have the disease, you've confirmed it with amyloid uh, scanning, you've confirmed it with amyloid blood tests, you have the disease, you're gonna get the infusion, you get a baseline MRI prior to having the infusion. You also get baseline genetic testing for the ApoE4 alleles. 
because if you have two of those, you're at a high risk for having hemorrhages and they won't infuse this drug into you. Then you get lecanemab, lecanemab infused into you. It takes about an hour. So you have to go into the office, have it infused into you, and you get that infusion every two weeks. Then you get an MRI on the fifth, seventh, and 14th infusion looking for any of the ARIA-related abnormalities, edema or, or small hemorrhaging. That's how the lecanemab is set up to infuse. Um, I wanted to share with you some of the initial data and information. This is a little more scientific. Uh, I'm hoping that it makes sense to you, uh, and it's a very short YouTube video that I want to show you next. Some evidence suggests that amyloid removal slows disease progression in Alzheimer's disease. In a phase 2b trial, the monoclonal antibody lecanemab, which binds with soluble amyloid beta protofibrils, was associated with clearance of amyloid in patients with early Alzheimer's disease. In this phase 3 multicenter double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial, 1,795 adults 50 to 90 years of age with early Alzheimer's disease were assigned to receive intravenous lecanemab at a dose of 10 mg per kilogram every two weeks, or placebo. The primary efficacy endpoint was the change from baseline in the score on the clinical dementia rating sum of boxes, a validated measure of cognition and function in Alzheimer's disease, assessing six domains that patients and caregivers identify as important. At 18 months, mean scores on this measure were higher than baseline, indicating increased impairment in both groups. The mean change in the score was smaller in the lecanemab group, indicating less cognitive and functional decline. Secondary endpoints, including scores on other Alzheimer's disease rating scales, also suggested less disease progression in the lecanemab group. The most common adverse events in the lecanemab group included infusion-related reactions and amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. The authors conclude that in adults with early Alzheimer's disease, Lecanemab was associated with less disease progression than placebo over 18 months. Full trial results are available at NEJM.org. What I explained to you, um, and in summary, I looked at and tried to help you again understand that Dementia is an umbrella and 60 to 70% of patients have Alzheimer's disease. The clinical presentation of Alzheimer's disease is crucial to make that as a clinical diagnosis to eliminate the others. But now we have available new brain scans, in particular amyloid PET scans and blood test biomarkers, in particular amyloid ratios and tau, tau uh, uh, elevations and we have an FDA approved treatment. I know what I did was very complex. I'm hoping I tried to make it simple. Again, since this is being recorded, you can go back and walk through it at your pace to understand it or suggest that others who you know uh, who might wanna know this information have it available. As I mentioned at the very beginning when I showed this slide, I think the most important thing to take home is that if someone you're worried about has some cognitive loss, you think there's a likelihood they have Alzheimer's disease, we now have a way to confirm that diagnosis and we have treatments for them. If this is Minnie Mouse, we can help her. Um, I believe over the next several years, you're gonna hear more and more, you're gonna see better infusion therapies, you're going to see advances more in the diagnosis, uh, and I think this is the beginning of the highest likelihood that we now have the ability to eliminate Alzheimer's disease uh, for future generations. Thank you for listening. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Please feel free to unmute. Um, Dr. Dow, I have a couple of questions that came up during the presentation. Um, one of the first question that came up was, 
are there criteria I need to satisfy to get the lab core blood draw? Uh, the lab core blood draw blood draw is done based upon your doctor's orders. So will your physician order the blood test to be done? Um, and, and that all I think hinges upon that physician's understanding of this information um, because ordering the blood test is the simple part. Interpreting it and deciding what that means for you uh, is the complicated part of this. Um, uh, again, I, I, I go back to and I like Minnie and Mickey. If you're Minnie and you have a loved one who's Minnie who has mild cognitive impairment, doing this testing can confirm that diagnosis and can begin the process whereby she can get into treatment. Mm -hmm. um, doing the testing on Mickey, I don't know what that's going to say. I don't know what that test means. I don't know how to interpret it. I believe that in the next years, we'll have an answer to that. Um, but the criteria to get the test done is your doctor believes there's a value to doing that test and we'll order that test. Uh, if, if you don't want to deal in the doctor world, you can go to Quest and get the test done yourself. Um, like I mentioned, they do have a physician available to you after you do that test. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see the understanding that that physician is, has and is able to give you. Uh, and again, the only test they're doing is the amyloid ratio test. And this may be a more like a quest question. One of the follow up to that, Dr. Dial, was are they able to obtain a copy of that test to send to their actual physician? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, if, if you go to the Quest Labs, you will, you will get a copy that you can take to your physician or send to your physician. Uh, if you tell Quest you'd like it sent to your physician, absolutely don't do that. The next question that came up, Dr. Dial, is are there any medication that could affect the results of the lab draw from LabCorp or Quest? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, there's, there's no medicines that I, I know of right now that are gonna alter the amyloid level in your blood uh, to determine this. That's all the questions that I have. There are a couple up there. Um, confused about the use of MRI with new medicines as opposed to PET scans. So the MRIs today cannot diagnose Alzheimer's disease. The MRIs of the future might be able to do more. And I included that only to be complete in the, di in the discussion. The MRI that we do prior to the infusions is to look for the complications that lecanemab can induce. Um, we can't look at the amount of amyloid in your brain with an MRI. The future might be that we replace the amyloid PET scans with an MRI if the MRI is able to be manipulated for us to tell um, that, that you have amyloid disease of the brain. But that's not, that's not there right now. So currently, the PET amyloid scan is the one you should be asking for or talking to people about. Uh, how long is the treatment using lecanemab? We don't know yet. Um, uh, I suspect if you enter into treatment now in 18 months, which is what the protocol was, we'll know a lot more. Um, and we'll know whether you continue it. Uh, we'll know how, how much benefit it's been to you. Uh, we can understand uh, as an individual what we should be doing. And I'm hoping we understand better at the end of 18 months. Um, Within the blood marker section of the presentation, you mentioned that currently it needs to be used with other methods in order to fully confirm the diagnosis, such as a PET scan. Do you think in the future, it's overall viability of the blood markers like uh, tau 217, uh, you picked up on that, thank you very much, will become standardized as a concrete way of definitively determining the diagnosis. Uh, I do think there's a chance that you will not have to combine a scan and a blood test as we get more sophisticated with blood testing. Um, I think right now, because we're going to be recommending an infusion of a fairly toxic drug, you can see 10% of people getting this drug have a complication, um, you know, that, that we ought to do it with the best testing we have now 
which includes both the PET scan and the blood testing. Um, the question goes on to say, uh, will, will it be able to be used as a predictability test that in conjunction or only a confirmatory test? Uh, what's going to be the fastest and most cost of way, cost effective way to confirm a diagnosis? Um, you know, at this point, um, my recommendation to community primary care physicians is that you can order an amyloid PET scan on someone like Minnie Mouse, who's mildly impaired. And if that amyloid PET scan confirms that they likely have Alzheimer's disease, then make the referral to the neurologist. Uh, they can do blood testing if they want. Uh, after a discussion with the patient, since again, that's not covered, um, they can then begin the process of discussion of the MRIs uh, and the infusion of the canamab. So I think that's where I would go as a primary care physician, uh, or if I was recommending to a family member uh, or a friend. Uh, patient, uh, individual says that their husband has a diagnosis of mixed dementia, both vascular and Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, he's on blood thinners because of the vascular dementia. He's also taking um, the Minda, um, uh, Mementine, anything else on the horizon for helping him. I would certainly um, be um, confirming his Alzheimer's disease. Um, he's on the treatment that we would recommend for vascular dementia, which is hypertension control, potentially blood thinners. Um, if he has Alzheimer's and has a confirmatory um, blood test and amyloid scan, uh, would he be eligible to go ahead and get the lecanemab infusion? Um, it depends on how far along his disease is. Uh, you mentioned it was diagnosed in 2020. Um, usually at the time of diagnosis, they've moved into stage one. They're not mild cognitive impairment. Um, and so I suspect he's further along than what they're going to want to have and think that the lecanemab would help him. So at this point, I suspect he will not be a candidate uh, with therapy that could help him. Uh, but if you want to know that, I think you start with an amyloid scan to confirm the Alzheimer's uh, and then go to a neurologist and have that discussion. Are there any other questions from the audience? You can also unmute um, if it's easier to ask the question via Zoom. Hi, Dr. Lanyard. This is Kevin Cox. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I have two questions. Does Medicare require symptomatology or a certain level of symptomatology to pay for the amyloid test? And the second question is regarding the NFL. You mentioned that some neurological diseases also increase NFL. How about vascular dementia and or alcoholic dementia? Yeah, I think the NFL is increased in a variety of other diseases. Uh, I, and I, I, I believe it's increased in the vascular dementias. I believe it's increased in, in the others that I mentioned on there, the uh, Parkinson's and uh, ALS-like like syndromes. Um, I think as a combination, using it in combination with the other two tests is what LabCorp has recommended um, to give a clearer panel picture. Um, I, I suspect we'll move away from it because it's too nonspecific. Um, as far as does Medicare require a specific diagnosis prior to approve an amyloid PET scan? I think they want to see the diagnosis of, I suspect they have Alzheimer's. They have um, early cognitive loss. Those kinds of things would be what I think Medicare would want to see, um, but I don't think that they're uh, pre-approving or screening. I, I think that you order it, they're going to they're going to approve it. That's what Medicare does with almost every scan. Now, the managed care Medicare programs are a different story, and each are going to have their own belief and criteria of covering it. But they they're because they are Medicare. Um, required by Medicare to provide the services that Medicare covers, they have to provide an amyloid scan. They may limit it um, by limiting who they believe it's appropriate for, just like they do limiting any MRI or any PET scan for cancer. Um, you know, they manage the Medicare dollars. 
uh, but they will cover it. Uh, each one is going to have their own criteria. Uh, I think the criteria that they should all use is the doctor's belief this person has mild cognitive impairment, and they may say they have to have an MMA, uh, mini mental status exam uh, that has a certain number. They may say they need a MOCA with a certain number. Each, I am sure each managed care plan right now is trying to clarify its um, criteria to approve an amyloid PET scan. Thank you so much for everyone's um, participation today. I know it was a very informative webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Dial. Um, as we've mentioned earlier, this presentation will be, uh, is recorded and will be available for viewing through our website. Thank you all.